every time I come in the kitchen, you in the kitchen, in the goddamn refrigerator. I sure am hungry. Yo, 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 welcome back everybody to the Morning Dinner Podcast. It's your boy Keem and... Oh, yep. Chuck. There we go. I'm always right on, <laughs> right on cue. And uh, on today's special episode, we have Ryan Visconti in the house. Yes, and he's going to talk to us. He's going to talk to us about his project that he's got going on right now. It's called the Eximo Project. Uh, I don't know too too much about it. Yeah. I've looked it up a little bit from what you sent me. We'll dive in. But I really wanted to meet you and kind of have you walk me through exactly yeah. what it is and what it entails. So whenever you're ready, man. Yeah. So Eximo is a movement system. Okay. Uh, and it's a movement system that bases itself around principles rather than techniques. Um, so in gathering techniques, what I do is I research different movement cultures, whether it be anything from martial arts like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, dance, contemporary, I mean, any background. Um, and I find commonalities within those disciplines. Mm -hmm. I isolate those commonalities and I develop techniques around them. Mm -hmm. how, how long have you been doing the Eximo project for? Doing it for three years. Did you did you create it or did yeah, you? Yeah, no, it's me. So you, okay, so you started Ground this up. whole project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ground now, up. How um, how, so how do you physically describe something like this to somebody? Like if they wanted to visualize how it's done, how would you describe it to them? I'd say it's a movement system uh, that mainly focuses on floor work. Floor work, and that mm -hmm. gives people the best description. And ultimately, it's not. That's the avenue that I've started in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think visually, if I say movement system. Uh, at this point in time, I think it's too broad, mm. uh, especially the fitness culture where they are. It's not, it's not where it is yet. So yeah. I, I pair it with floor work just to give it a little more of a um, association. Okay. Okay. One thing I can't even like. Yep. What's floor work exactly? Floor work is your ability to move around on the floor. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So anything I would say from a crouching position on downward. Oh. So from okay. crouching to laying down. Yeah. I would say are the is kind of the area that I focus in on most. Yeah, if you actually go on his website, uh, you have some videos on there that show examples of yeah, yeah. what it looks yep. like. I have a few trailers yeah. and all that stuff. Um, trailers and then different uh, videos of me um, working on specific techniques mm -hmm. and all that fun stuff. Um, yeah. Now, what exactly is your website so people can check it out? www.theexemo, and eximo spelled E-X-I-M-O, project.com. See, I was butchering the pronunciation on that. It happens all the time. Eczema. It happens all the time. Eczema, yeah. Eczema. I think it it's happens all the time. I think it's because I have eczema, so, <laughs> so that's kind of why I got the ex. Yeah. <laughs> well, an exit, I think, in this language, in this that, language, exit. Yeah. I think exi. So, so you've common. been doing it since 2015. Yeah. So I had a movement company before called Rhythm Bending, which is very dance based. Uh -huh. Um, and the ceiling on that was too low. Uh, eczema Project was an offshoot of that. Was that was just going to focus on floor work, mm -hmm. and with that, uh, that kind of just wound up having a lot more ability to scale and work with different people and different backgrounds and different cultures. Mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, I chose to speak with that. Plus it, it was a challenge. I'm big on basing yourself in your weaknesses. Yeah. I mean, my strengths is like plyometrics. I have a track and field background. Oh, so wow. things like aerials, stuff like that, any type of explosive stuff is easy for me. So on the floor, um, dealing rather with strength as opposed to explosiveness, uh, things like fluidity, much different for me. And so it was a challenge for myself. And ultimately that's yeah. why I, Mm -hmm. I stuck to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you, so you you have a you have a you told me you had a, a a background in dance and martial arts. Yeah. How how does that how do you incorporate that into the Eximo project? The Eximo, Ex Eximo. <laughs> Sorry, I keep butchering that, man. Well, so I'll speak on the biggest commonality between the both, and that's rhythms. Mm -hmm. I think the best way to imbue new movement patterns into your sets, and by imbue, I mean you know learning a pattern and then being able to integrate integrate it into a point where it reaches improvisation. Mm -hmm. is through rhythms. Rhythm, for sure. I think rhythm creates uh, a very big, just a higher level of retention, for sure, because I think there's a, a deeper level of connection, I think emotionally, mm -hmm. um, definitely physically, uh, because with the rhythms, the patterns are closed loop, meaning they feed back on each other. Um, I think it holds the person accountable to finish the move and start moves over and over. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the biggest thing. So it's kind of like a... Like a, a, a a choreographed thing is that is that is that kind of what it is when you say rhythm well I, I you could say rhythm from a fixed point yeah absolutely um i mean my teachings aren't choreographed at all mm. we cover different subjects um subjects like fluidity as a building block for speed the relationship between the spine and the extremities structure as a building block for power and so on and so on as i said more principle based mm -hmm. um you guys actually have a good dance friend of mine that was on the show and that's how i found out about the show okay yeah yeah uh, who, who uh, was it desmond desmond oh desmond yeah, yeah, yeah my man desmond, <laughs> that's right yeah so 2000 so i started eczema in 2015 in new york and um from 2014 to 2012 i trained in vegas 
and me and him would session together all the time. Mm. That's yeah. so dope. Over at the old district arts off Flamingo and Buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. I know I know okay. that area pretty so, well. So uh yeah. no, great dude. Great dude. And so yeah. that's how I found out about the show. Uh, okay, so tell me, um, as far as uh your teaching, mm-hmm. where, where do exactly do you teach the the practice of eczema? So I teach it currently. I was working with a home studio. Um, that studio regrettably closed down. Uh, but now I, t- I still teach all over the states. Mm-hmm. So I work with primarily private studios, um, performing arts high schools, mm-hmm. universities. So um, in two weeks, I'll be teaching at Alvin Ailey Fordham University, mm-hmm. uh, NYU, John Hopkins in, in the spring. Oh, oh wow. that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, and then and then local studios as well. Mm-hmm. So I was just in Salt Lake and I taught at a private studio and then Salt Lake's premier performing arts high school. So, uh, yeah. So what would you say your, your ultimate goal with the Eximo project would be going down the road? I think my ultimate goal would be to make it scalable to where everyone can do it. Um, I think, you know, the tough part is, is when you're advertising something, it needs to be flashy to an extent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I created Eximo, I did a lot of, um, recordings of me freestyling because I knew that that would get a lot of engagement. And mm-hmm. so that kind of got the first wave in and that's when I did my first summer tour. And the second one, I more shaped it around teachings, but I went around bigger schools. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going around universities and because I feel like I've reached the top, I kind of want to go this way now, mm-hmm. you know, cause I've, I've gone this way and I want to be able to go this way and work with a wider variety of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when you work with um, older people or people of different movement backgrounds, it also really reinforces your teachings and tests them out. Yeah. Uh, I definitely want to get in and teach more of the grappling culture mm-hmm. for sure. When you say grappling culture, what BJJ, that wrestling, sambo, judo, things like that. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would definitely like to get into that culture for sure. That'd be mm-hmm. so dope. Yeah. That'd be a good one. Um, I just did uh, a four week pilot with an adult class um, of people 60 and older. Okay. So yeah, that was it. That was kind of a test to be able to see if it would be able to get into gyms. Mm-hmm. So, so let me ask you, what is the purpose behind eczema? Like, what is it supposed to do for people? Um, so, I mm-hmm. mean, I, it, sure. I've seen people like kind of do it, use it as like an exercise kind of mm-hmm. tool, but is there anything else be- uh, that kind of pushes the narrative of being able to do it behind sure. it? So I'll speak to two things. One is I could just say the blanket term of to move better. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, Movement. Um, but if I'm to say uh, more specifically, I think when you educate the nervous system in specific, so I think we entered a time where the way people work out is, is it's limited pattern sets, but higher intensity, right? Mm-hmm. The, yeah. the exercises now are more fatigue seeking. That's mm-hmm. the goal. Everyone wants to be out of breath, panting on the floor. You know, that to them is when they felt they worked out. Yeah. But the problem becomes is, you know, you have someone who can deadlift, double their body weight, but throws out their back, tying their shoes. Mm. you know because their body is very tense tense or i mean and even further to add to that point because of the fact that if you train the spine in certain ways you know and more importantly if you educate your nervous system to not get set in a certain way yep i think what winds up happening is you're able to adapt to a variety of circumstances better so as the landscape shifts you're able to shift mm-hmm. that ultimately it is what it is i mean because the muscles are going to do what the muscles are going to do yeah um so yeah, I would say definitely. I would say pliability of the nervous system. Then, if I were to encapsulate it into a singular term, have you ever heard of a uh, fascial stretch therapy? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. We, you guys had a guest on here. Yeah, yeah. She yeah. Was okay, I haven't seen the episode yeah, yet, yeah. but yeah. yes, it was interesting. Yeah, was we. we uh, her name is Rebecca. Mm-hmm. Uh, she has her own little company called Bliss Stretch, and she does fascial stretch therapy. And she kind of educated <clears> as far as like how there's layers of fascia in in mm-hmm. in your body, and the point behind the massages is to kind of loosen and and unwind the tension that's built up inside your body so that you're able to be more flexible and be able okay. to stretch more. And, and I, and I think that kind of ties into what you're kind of doing For because sure. it's also, it, it kind of, it works as another way of serving the same purpose of, of being able to relax the body mm-hmm. and release that tension. Yeah. Um, how, how do you train for, for the, for the eczema project? For certain skills? Yeah. Uh, so I think the important thing to note, skill-based training is, is the complete opposite of what you currently see. So it shouldn't be fatigue, mm-hmm. uh, style training Mm -hmm. and to add to the tissue point is you want to give the tissues a point to adapt and catch up to the development of the muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of the times, and you see it in gymnastics training, people think they have like an injury to the muscle when actually it's an injury to the joint. And a lot of that I think occurs because of um, wear and tear on tissues. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, So to answer your question, a lot of, there's a lot of different ways of progressing. Um, First and foremost, as I said, I think the biggest thing is that 
is that you do it in moderation. So when you leave workouts, really you shouldn't be redlining the body too much. Mm -hmm. you, you should leave a lot of the times feeling refreshed because yeah. the red line, you know, pushing your body to the limit it should be used very delicately is what yeah. I'm going to say. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of what I've been told too. Cause I, mm -hmm. I know some people at uh smash iron fitness. There's a gym. Down okay. The street. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know if you know Jay and Carlo, uh, but they, uh, they, one of the things that they always kind of preach is uh, they're not the kind of gym where you want to go, even though they have like, you know, deadlifting and all that stuff. They're not the kind of gym that preaches that you should just work yourself until you're dead. Mm -hmm. Like you should always leave the gym feeling good. Yeah. And, and uh, with more energy than when you walked in. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I definitely, I agree with what, with what you mean uh, as far as you shouldn't, you know, have to push, you said redlining, right? That's what it's called. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah redlining redlining body. your body until mm -hmm. you feel like you're dead. Cause even though, Cause, because there's ways for you to do the exercise with get, have, having gotten more for your body yeah. than having to have killed yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one of the common misconceptions is like, okay, well, I want to get quality in, you know, or I want to get a certain amount in. But if you look at someone, you know, who has to take every other, let's say you're dancing and you want to dance, you know, one pers person dances their max, you know, every day for an hour, but has to take always the following day off versus the person who dances every day it's constantly doing or let's that. but so let's say only does it 45 minutes in moderation mm -hmm. you know over the year that person who did it in moderation is going to have a vast higher understanding of their ability to improv mm -hmm. than the other person so I, I think when you break down metrics like that it becomes pretty evident and as i said redlining i think has its place 100 yeah, sure. percent. yeah especially closer to competition yeah, times you're a competitor and exactly everything. yeah closer to competition mm -hmm. times 100 percent. but let's um, keep it real like 99 percent of people out there are enough. not yeah. competing or right? just regular so but skill based like let's say someone has a personal goal that they want to reach you know mm -hmm. x amount of time on a three minute mile or whatever it may be i think uh I think those are all applicable even towards, you know, you want to do 15 pull-ups, whatever it may be. I think it's mm -hmm. something that it, applies. Is eczema, is eczema something that anybody of any age can do or is it limited to an, an, an age group? So so anybody of any age can do it for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but I like to obviously keep it within a certain age range for quality of the class. Mm. You know, I mean, because I can, I can do classes anywhere from 90 minutes to I've done for, you know, three days. Oh, so three days and it's not three days. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's not 24 hours. <laughs> I was like, no, no. damn, it was, uh, was pretty intense. <laughs> three, three, six hours. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dang. Wait, Dang so, three, six hours. Yeah. yeah. That's so okay. three, six hour. Yeah. Classes. Yeah. yeah. Dang. So how, how is that on the, on the body? How is that? Like, do people walk out of there feeling re refreshed or, you know, I've, I've cultivated it in a way that over time to make sure that you leave pretty, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You leave seeking more, but at the same time, there's definitely enough of a beating because people feel, I, I've noticed that in order for people to want it again, they have to feel like there was a level of push for sure. Yeah. And there, people like to feel a little level. Oh yeah. Cause they feel like they, they've grown. They're like, like oh, I feel sore. That means my body's building right now. Yeah, That's yeah. usually how it is. No, no, for sure. Um, and to leave them with a little level of defeat. So often at the end of class, like I'll, I'll do a certain skill and I'll take the skill just to a certain level where I know about only 5% of the class can get it. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, that gets, it's like hook, line and sink that gets people all into that. Mm. So, so what, what, what then principles would you say that eczema brings? It, like in a classroom. So I'll take you kind of like what we do in a class. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's I'll do take that. You, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I taught at the Salt Lake Performing Arts High School. Um, so we started out with a group warm up. We did something called linear patterns. Mm -hmm. We did uh, different types of partner drills different type of rhythm drills. Uh, we do skill building at the end. And then I'll use these t certain tools to focus on certain principles. Um, so the two, the two things that I focused on the most was fluidity as a building block for speed mm -hmm. and mobility from the iframe are the two ones that I, I uh, this last week and that I focused most on. Mobility on the iframe? Iframe. So from hip, spine, shoulders, that I. Mm -hmm. Like a capital yeah, I, not like that. an I dot. Mm. The iframe. Yeah, yeah. Well, iframe is strictly, you won't find anywhere. It's an eczema term only. I oh, frame I was like, iframe is eczema term only. Yeah, yeah. Smart. Yeah, that sounds pretty exclusive. Yeah, I was like, ooh. <laughs> so, Wait, so how did you end up learning about all this stuff? I just researched different movement cultures, you know, hung around mm -hmm. a lot of people who were much better than I was. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say, I mean, that was just the thing. I just wanted to, you know, for me personally, I think the benefit was always having an affinity towards something that would break me. Mm -hmm. But over time I had to kind of cultivate that. So I would actually um, be prosperous in something and profitable in something. Yeah. Or otherwise I'd just be good at some, this. Is, and this is what I did for the longest time. I'd be good at something, leave it, be good at something, leave it, be good at something, leave it. Cause once I got to a level where I'm like, Oh, like I'm, I'm pretty legit at this. I'm like, ah, it's boring. 
Um, Dang, we so, can relate a lot to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but over time, I mean, the cool thing was, is then I was able to cross-examine and pull different things together mm -hmm. and look at different parallels mm -hmm. amongst different movement cultures. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I, I guess you could say I approach to learning it all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and just watching people move. I think when you watch people move, a lot of people are very, very stiff. Yeah, um, a lot yeah. of people. And it's not tested. As I said, the stiffness isn't tested, I think, until you get in different scenarios. You know, and I also think certain physical capabilities are very misleading mm -hmm. and certain physical capabilities are overvalued. Um, I think softness is a prime example. Like softness is something that, is favored, let's say, in wrestling where it's like 50-50 in terms of strength and technique. Mm -hmm. When you go into like BJJ, it's 90-10. No one cares how much you can bench, mm -hmm. you know, how strong yeah, your lats are. Yeah, it's all about technique. Exactly. And the softer you are, the better. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, so somebody practicing the, the this uh, practice of eczema, how often would you – because I know like people say when you go to the gym, you should go like three to five times a week if you really wanted to get in shape and all that stuff. Yeah. For eczema project, how, how often would you recommend is like a good amount to practice it? I mean, ultimately, and naturally, it's it's to what the person finds and, and is... Uh, able to do? Yeah, is able to do, seeks the most. Um, I would say, look, whatever you're looking to get out of the practice, mm -hmm. I think is, is paramount. Right. You know, um, if you have certain goals in mind. Ultimately, though, I would just say it's, you know, a lifestyle deal. Like talking about things like fascia and whatnot. It's something that you constantly have to do over the course of time, you know, whether if you want to have a better squat, you have to squat throughout the day. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to have a better side split, you have to side split throughout the day. You don't side split to the point where you can't move your legs anymore. Yeah. Right. So with eczema, I would just say, you know, do it and work on whatever, you know, components you want to work on. And they're all going to overflow into the next. Yeah. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. There, there, there's a couple of things that you you had sent me that you wanted to speak about. Mm -hmm. um, that were uh, the first thing being. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a few questions I took from people. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Had, okay, I put okay, it out there. Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. So, okay, okay, so then the importance of sensitivity within creativity. What do you mean by that? So I think, especially now, it's like the era of the creative. Everyone wants to create yeah. almost to where there's an overabundance of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there isn't uh, a certain level of. I guess you could say sensibility or sensitivity to what is really effective in the art. I think people sometimes strap themselves to dogmas that in the end they wind up defending. Okay. You know, so someone's like, oh yeah, you know, I want to um, be very creative with my feet, you know, but they wind up, you know, only they wind up getting to a certain point where, you know, it just no longer serves them. And I think there, there, there's a certain sensitivity to see how far you're going to, the trajectory of your progress is, and then being able to, kind of curve that and go into different areas if that makes sense um do you mean like doing something with purpose right you could say with purpose is, is or with that, intent that, for okay. sure but I, I, as i said and it's ultimately to the user i think is purpose and intent can be misleading people are like oh well i mean it you know and, mm -hmm. and therefore they can define that as purpose um i just think in whatever you know you create there has to be a level of you can even look at it as a level of intimacy mm-hmm you know, to where there are certain things you have to really ask yourself, like, am I doing this for me or am I doing this for that at this point? Right. Mm -hmm. Like people will dance, let's say they'll, they'll work on popping techniques, you know, and, and they'll work on popping for years and years on end. But the what's popping exactly? Poppy, you know, the Pop contracting. Oh, of the, your, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not huge into dance or oh, like, sorry, all that my stuff. apologies. No, no, it's yeah. all good. I'm here yeah. to learn. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just, whenever I hear, I hear a term that I don't understand, yeah. I'm like, I gotta, it's I gotta find out what that is too. or, or I'm like, not going to catch poppin'? on. <laughs> like popping joints? Pop, lock and drop. That's what are. you mean. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, gotcha. I mean anything. So let's say, um, yeah, I could use an example like break dancing or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'll, I'll use popping in this specific instance. So people, someone pops for, you know, a couple of years, but their next level in adapting to the music and how they hear the music, you know, isn't going to come from popping anymore, right? And there has to be a level of sensitivity to know like, okay, like popping's gotten me to, from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. I have to kind of be sensible and sensitive enough within my creative process if I'm really just, if I'm truly interested in just the progress and process of creating. Mm -hmm. Got it. Otherwise, it just caps at the end and people think, and people can people stay creative within like a respective sphere of work, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to, I'm trying to think. And oh, you, sorry. You're, you're seeing it more as something like where you take in from every aspect of dance and you just do, instead of like capping yourself, mm -hmm. you try to learn something else or. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and just to be, I mean, in a way selfish, I mean, it's the journey is about the user mm -hmm. 100% and, and to do it for you and then realize at a certain point, 
Um, you know, as I said, I got, for me, I worked on upright dance styles for a long time. I never really trained on any floor stuff. Everyone thinks I have all the schools I've taught it. I have no college degree. I've never taken a contemporary or modern uh, dance class. You know, I've taken maybe a total of three break dance classes and, you know, ever. Um, but I understood that in my next adapt, you know, ability to adapt as a mover and being sensitive within that process was to go on the floor. Mm. If that makes oh, sense. Crazy. So if I want, if I wanted to keep adapting, I needed to take it to the floor yep. or take it to a different direction. And the trouble and the hard part is, is the current vector that I was on is people get rewarded for staying on a long path, you know, right? I mean, mm -hmm. people box for 20 years, they become champions and that's all great. But in terms of, in my opinion, true spiritual benefit and pr progressing, you know, for the user being open and being a better mover. I, I think that's the wrong idea, mm -hmm. you know, and there has to be a point where you're like, you know, like, okay, I'm serving it. It's not serving me anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could be true to yourself at that point. For sure. Anything you do. For yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think it's interesting because I was watching a couple of your videos and you really do use the floor as like a tool, you know, like mm -hmm. to, to work with the body. And I've yeah. never, I never seen that before. And I, when I caught, I caught my eye when I started watching the videos and you're like moving on the floor and I'm like, and I'm like, I know that's got to feel good because I've laid on the floor whenever like my back is feeling weird and I've just kind of like done moved these, weird, yeah, yeah. move like, you know, just <laughs> for sure. Cause gravity does mm -hmm. most of the work, right? Like 100%, you know, and yeah, you know yeah. your body better than anybody because you know where certain pains are and so yeah. you can be like, oh, yeah. that feels the best if you turn like that. Yeah, I I've learned things from uh, from Jay at Smash Iron where you kind of lay on your back, you have your uh, knees up, and then you just tilt them to the right or to the left. Okay. And it's combined with like a breathing technique. Um, oh. When you, as you move your knees down, you breathe. I don't want to mess this up because it's been a while since I've done Breathe it. out, right? Uh, you breathe in. You breathe in. And as the legs come back up, you breathe out. Oh, okay. And the yeah, same way, sense. yeah. From a compression yeah, yeah. standpoint. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, that, that's kind of when I, when I saw your thing, I'm like, okay, that's, that's got to feel good too. Uh, yeah. So, how, how many people have you, have you how, like, how big are your classes usually? They can vary in shape. I do want to talk about the, the lying on the floor and uh -huh. whatnot. Um, I think, you know, one of the fundamental things is, every, you know, from walking around all day and your spine being on an axis like this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. drastically changes just to going like this from the way you use your hip joints, your shoulder joints, yeah. um, anterior chain, posterior chain. And I think a lot of people just, it feels so much better also because it's like this foreign goodness because it's something that's not done yeah. very often. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, what was your question? Uh, how, how big are your classes usually when you teach them? They've gone everything from 10 to 40. Really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Now, um, how, how are you able to help everybody individually? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I cap them normally at, uh, I'm a little greedy, but I also cap, I try to cap them. Because yeah. you know, when someone says, hey, I want to have more people that come, I don't want to shut people out. Yeah. Um, but normally, like when I uh, talk to people about class sizes and they ask me, I normally do it about 30 because that keeps just enough of an intimacy level. Beyond that, it becomes a little tough. Mm -hmm. uh, but all I do is I just stretch certain teachings. So if it's beyond that, I'll just do certain teachings for a little longer to make sure I can, I can kind of go around the room and talk to people uh, and still engage and interact with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, e either one is really good. I think the benefit with a small class is small class not naturally is intimacy. Um, the bigger class, the energy, a lot of the times mm -hmm. is, is just, this, it just moves in a certain way. Yeah. Cause everybody's that, on the same wave, wavelength. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very powerful wavelength when it becomes like 40 people deep. Yeah. yeah so now, uh, when, when, when you guys do your, your movements on the Eximo, do you guys, uh, do you guys listen to music or how, how's that experience like? Music on typically only during the warm up. As okay. I said, it's it's more of a movement practice than mm -hmm. dance. I think initially I framed it more as dance, just as I said, because it would be easier for people to understand. Mm -hmm. But you know, as layers, as you know, time goes on, like layers of an onion, I just keep pulling it away and pulling it away uh -huh. because I don't, uh, you know, because I feel I've always had a lot more teachings, the dance component, the athletic component, but I, I couldn't d put them all just under the dance, or or else it wouldn't make sense. It would right. be incoherent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, music for, for part of it. Um, but yeah, a lot of it, as I said, it's very engaging. There's a lot of partner work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different drills where it's about, you know, it has different levels of accountability. Mm -hmm. So now is there, is there like a speed that the whole class moves at or is everybody moving in their, good own, question. their own speed? Yeah. Good question. Um, so at the beginning of the class, I specifically say that we do a warm up at a pace cause that's pretty much going to dictate the pace for the class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when they, so because um, just like the adage, you know, whatever you eat in the morning kind of sets the tone for how you're going to eat the rest of the day, Right. how we move at the beginning of the class, how I prep their nervous system is ultimately going to prep them for the rest of the class. Mm -hmm. And so, 
yeah, we do a warm up um, to kind of a certain cadence, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think they know that it's a certain cadence. I do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and so that kind of sets the tone for everything. Just because when you get into certain, when you get into certain partner work and certain rhythm exercises or certain things, people become a little spastic, and I think there becomes an urge to rush, especially if there's a task at hand. If I say you have to get from point A to point B, or you have to finish a complete loop of something, um, there becomes a, a tension to rush. And, and naturally, as you yeah, see in all disciplines, yeah. that's really um, true. Yeah, I yeah. yeah. So uh, so yeah, um, I do. I, I kind of set a certain cadence for, but we kind of we we will move on and off certain rhythms for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's important, yeah, to get everyone Man, on the same page yeah, we to had begin an, with. We had another question. Um, yeah, what's the search for a unified theory in one's practice? So the search for a unified theory in one's practice is basically. To I guess you could see it as you know the commonality that runs through all of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. I, I think it is corrosive to the mover to have all these different disciplines and then look back and see them all as separate. Mm-hmm. I think the only way that there becomes a true um, feeling of being whole at the end is if you search for those unified theories that ran through all of them. So if you had a martial arts background, if you had a dance background, if you had a gymnastics background, to look back and see the commonalities amongst all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think it opens uh, the perspective naturally to the mover. Uh, I think it, and and I think after that, when you see that when people do search for a unified theory, their productivity and their ability to achieve whatever the task is at hand really does tenfold because then they're approaching it, you know, not just with a wider lens, but with no lens altogether. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, I'm trying to put. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. A unified theory is it kind of like um like how can you relate it to something that's outside of outside of of movement? Outside of movement, yeah. yeah. I mean, mathematics. I think is is plenty of unified theories for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, if it, you know, and I'm not trying to dumb this down too much, but I mean, it's simple like one plus one. I mean, there are certain things that. You know, if I lift my cup up, no matter you know, no matter what, it's going to drop. Yeah. You know, those are are unified theories, if mm-hmm. you will, mm-hmm. um, theories that run, you know, through everything. I mean, we call them physics, we call it chemistry, we call it biology, we call so, it mathematics. So, is it kind of like like a why finding your why? Is that is that kind of what it what it's like? I wouldn't call it finding a why because I find a why to be too flimsy of a term. I don't think there's enough accountability in a why. I mm. think when you, people attach themselves to the why, they kind of cheat themselves. Expl- you know, explain that a little bit more. Yeah, that's interesting because I think the why is strapped to a purpose and it ties back to eventually people people get to a point where they defend their own dogma and narrative so i have a narrative for why i'm doing and i push this hard under this narrative to achieve this mm-hmm. right well there becomes so if okay prime example i'm balls to the wall i'm trying to achieve 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 right well that gets me to from point a to point b in achieving but in the meantime though i haven't been very engaged with my family you know i've shut out all social components mm-hmm. i've been a shitty friend yeah you know things like that um, you take away from all other uh, other aspects of your life for to sure. make one stronger for sure and yeah. i mean and then if we condense it you know and look at it within the context of a single culture mm-hmm. you know or a single movement discipline you know people will pers- will constantly pursue a move or you know i'm trying to get this sequence you know you see it in break dancing a lot mm-hmm. you know i'm trying to get an air flare to this maneuver or whatever it yeah. may be and i think after a while you know, you wind up defending that. Mm-hmm. You wind up because I, I don't care who it is. When when you pursue things like that, it, it stagnates your 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 progress to a certain point. I think that it's it's a good motivator to a degree, but after a while, I think it really does stagnate your progress. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think it, it ties back into the why. Why am I doing something? You know, some people some people might say, "Oh, I'm trying to do it because I want to have an, a stronger upper body." But once again, I mean, those are. You know, I'm trying to do it because I want to have a more explosive upper body. I'm trying to do it because I want to understand counterbalancing better. Well, okay, that gets you from point A to point B. But if you're really searching those principles, you need to eventually surpass that technique and, and move on to a wider. So that's why I don't like the why, because mm-hmm. the why isn't vested enough in physicality. There you go. And I'm very and I'm very there big on yeah. put up or shut up. I'm very big on a put up or shut up culture. It's all the cultures I've always taken part in. Uh-huh. I mean, whether it be martial arts, track and field, dance. It's always like, you know, if people say you can do something, then okay, do it. You know, so I, I um, ha- have much affinity towards that in terms of process. Yeah, that's a, that's a really yeah. good perspective you- to have right there. Um, we had somebody ask, what's your perspective on manifesting your beliefs? Mm. 
the good old manifesting your belief. So I think, um, I think in, in the pursuit of anything, I think the problem is, is there's a detachment, you know, from, uh, where someone is and where they want to be. I'll start with this opening line. Uh, April of last year, I was in my mother's living room. Mm-hmm. My mother asked me, when are you going to teach at NYU? Mm-hmm. I told her, I've already taught at NYU. I have always taught at NYU. I'm just walking through time and it is manifesting. Mm-hmm. Well, in August, I got the confirmation that I will teach at NYU. Okay. And I think it comes from the mentality of that rather than what you want, or rather than what you're seeking, you have. Like, I, I've never thought myself as, you know, separate from what I'm doing. I've always thought myself as world class, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, as I said, I can't say it enough. You know, the difference between having the wanting mentality and the having mentality. I mean, do you guys, is that something? Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, I compl- that's yeah. almost co- goes back to the, uh, have you seen the movie The Secret on Netflix? I haven't. I've heard the, good things. The, I've yeah, heard very good things. It's basically uh, talking about how you need to approach life. If you want certain things, you need to behave and believe that you already have them. Mm-hmm. As much as like as much as you may not have those things, those things will come into your life if you attract that mentality into your life. So yeah. like for example, if I say like I want to have a lot of money one day, I need to I need to do the practice things that are gonna make me money mm-hmm. and I need to put them into a per and like practice every single day as well as already thinking like I'm already a rich man. Mm-hmm. You know, and yep. everything and everything that you that you do reflects that yeah, yeah. mentality. Yeah. So yeah. Well and the want I think I and the want too is a negative mentality. It's mm-hmm. a, you know, where I want to be, where I want to go. Mm-hmm. It's a negative mentality that bases itself out of a deficit. I mean, I don't, I don't quite frankly see how anything good can yeah. come from it, but yet it is very common, you know, even other things like people will talk about. I feel like wants are good for short term. Well, yeah, for right? sure. And I just don't feel, I guess I don't, I think the short term in a lot of ways, I just don't see, um, I appreciate the short term in a build up to something bigger. But the short term that just falls off after one step, I don't have much appreciation for. Yeah, because you don't get much out of it yeah. at the end of the day. It's just really fast. And that's like, oh. Manifesting it. That's interesting. So you, you, you go, you, everything in your life, you already, you have already attained it. That everything that you want. is that, For sure. As far as I can see. I'm very uh, honest yeah, yeah. about it too. I'm not like, I don't, I don't forecast anything that I don't really feel or can't foresee, mm-hmm. uh, if you will. Yeah. Um. Because certain people be like, oh, like after you get this, what are you going to do? I'm, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, Has there been anything that you ever like did want? That I didn't get? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, I, I'm going to, I mean, I think, yeah, but they're like, it's still petty things. So my mom would be like, you know, you're being, so I was, I wanted to get, so I, I can walk you through a slew of things and then I'll kind of show what I didn't and didn't. So okay. in April of 2016, I said I was going to teach in eight states over the summer. And mm-hmm. this was going to be like my first summer tour. Um, and then so, I mean, I wound up teaching at all eight. Um, I said at the end of my summer tour that I wanted to teach at schools at the Las, uh, within the Las Vegas uh, Clark County School District. Mm-hmm. And then eventually teach at LVA. Well, I wound up jumping all the schools and just teaching at LVA. Um, wow. Uh, and then after LVA, I said in, sp- in that following spring, I wanted to teach at five of the top performing arts high schools in the nation. Mm-hmm. So a little salty because I only got three. Uh-huh. Um, that's so really good. Hey, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's where my mom yeah, would yeah, do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things though. Like I, I always find that if you, if you, if you set goals that are like, that you feel like, oh, okay, those are unachievable, mm-hmm. but I'm going to set those anyways. Mm-hmm. And as, and if you fall short one or two, you still went leaps and bounds beyond yeah. what you would have gotten had you not had that mentality. For sure. So, yeah. And it's a very much play to win mentality. I mean, and everything I do, like I'm balls out, I'm very competitive, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, like if I lose or I don't get it, you know, I just take it on the chin and I just keep moving yeah, forward. That's the end of the world. But I do every time though, every time I approach it though, no matter the prior loss before I act like, mm-hmm. Like I'm here to take over. It does not matter. Yeah. The lost prior, it just is out of my rear view. Um, but yeah, other ones, um, I wanted to double my numbers from last year. So at the, by, at March, it was March of this past year, mm-hmm. or this year of 2018. And I said that by the end of this summer, I wanted to double my numbers of states that I taught in um, and get to 20. And by the end of summer, I got to 20. Yeah. Um, and the next conquest is... Uh, has been performing arts college, colleges or universities. Uh, and so I have some of those lined up. The end goal, to be quite frank, if the top of the mountain that I see is Juilliard, which is the premier mm-hmm. performing arts 
uh, university in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so you, but that, you already teach there, though. <laughs> no, I don't teach there yet. No, you already do. Well, you know, yes. Yeah. Very good, very That's good. The I already right have. <laughs> um, so, okay, so real quick, uh, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you feel you have... Because I can, I can attest to this, is I have an addictive personality when it comes to Excuse things that I do. For example, this podcast, right? Mm-hmm. How we've only been doing it three months, but we've already, this is our 34th episode, right? <laughs> That's insane. I mean, I mean, that is insane. Yeah, and they're all like, well, 99.9% of them are an hour to two hours long. Yeah. Uh, do you feel you have an addictive personality towards your passion? I feel I have an addictive personality in general. Okay. Feel whatever I strap myself. I'm just thinking. I, I think I'm just wise enough now to kind of know the boundaries between the good person, good addictive, good, good addictions. <laughs> yeah, good addictions, good addictions and bad addictions. For sure. Um, one hundred percent. I think it is something that is very much in my family. Mm-hmm. I think it is something that uh, cause has for prior generations they've they've achieved great great things as well. Yeah. Um but those prior generations I got to watch their shortcomings where it eventually kind of eroded them. Mm. And so that's where I kind of wanted to learn from. Yeah. Um Yeah, it's funny cuz they always say uh learn from your mistakes, mm-hmm. but my dad's always taught me that you should learn from other people's mistakes. Mm-hmm. That way you don't have to make them yourself. It's true. How do you feel about that? No, I think that's very true. I think if you only try to learn from your mistakes, I think the vantage point isn't far back enough for you to truly understand, you know? There's only so Um, much you can experience. Exactly. I mean, because it still is very subjective. So you can only remove yourself so much from your own mistake, but you see someone else blow it up and you're like, ah, come on, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So absolutely, I agree to that, yeah. And I do it especially within my family, um, you know, and, and seeing generations before that I have, I mean... You know, my dad went from literally, you know, from like zero to hero, but then again, eventually kind of got to him, mm-hmm. you know? So, uh, so yeah, definitely an addictive personality. As I said, I mean, I, I've only from, oh, sorry, from good. ages, uh, I mean, ages 16 to 26. I mean, I was like a bum. I mean, there was no, you know, no direction. I mean, I moved out at 16. I mean, it was, just, it was a joke. Like it was a decade of like, I might as well just flush the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, I'm 29 in the last three years. That's when I kind of. 25, I should say. So it's nine years down the toilet. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, but it was because of the whole addictiveness. I will add to the addictiveness part, you know, and I, I'd like to get your opinion on this. With the addictiveness, there's like this, there's like this friction of nervous energy that comes with it. There's this constant like this. Yeah. And for me, it took a while to understand that energy and that it wasn't something that was going to hold me back, that if I actually channeled it, but I would, I mean, I would have to hail Mary that mother in order to really channel it that I could eventually overcome it. Because, you know, as I saw it in generations prior, this energy, you know, that that constant friction against self but to self, you know, got people, I mean, skyrocketed to the top, but because it was strapped to that energy, they eventually, it was almost like an implosion. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, do you, is that something you feel you can relate to or am I riding solo on that one? I'm trying to understand. You mean the 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 feeling of of that addiction, if, if being a good or bad thing? You know that France. I mean, with an addiction, would it be ex- the anxiety of it or the? Yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of this this fran- franticness, if you will, that mm-hmm. comes with addictiveness. Do you agree with that? Oh yeah, 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 easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's always a whenever I get addicted to something new, whether whether I mean whether it's this podcast or mm-hmm. it's like working out or something, mm-hmm. I always have that like feeling in the back of my head of going like, what am I going to do to mess this up? Or how is this not going to be, how does, how is this going to get out of my control? Mm -hmm. And that feeling can either push you to one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I I completely agree with it. I think that's a lot of, a lot of it is mastering that frantic energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's hard though, because you see, in in my experience, a lot of people try to talk you away from that frantic energy. Yeah. Because that frantic energy can lead you to bad things or sometimes there are certain territories that people may not like about it. And I think a lot, you know, certain people may not understand it. Um, but that's like, in my opinion, the worst thing you could do is kind of, uh, a step away from that. But it took me a while to understand that and finally be able to channel it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I think why for so long, you know, when I was younger, it was so hard for me because I had this, I mean, so much energy and I just didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just had no idea. And I mean, it was, and I mean, anything I, even back then, anything I strap myself to, I would still be, you know, good at that's when I, that's when I practiced martial arts at that time or whatever. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I've always had that, uh, 
if, if there's ever a time in my life when I'm not doing something, mm-hmm. I do feel like there there is something I should definitely be doing. Um, and I think that's where that addiction, addic, 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 ooh, I can't even, <laughs> I can't speak today. That addictive quality comes into place because uh, I feel like I should be doing something. Mm-hmm. And, and when I am doing that thing, I do have this thought in the back of my head that I'm not doing enough. You know okay, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I completely agree with that. Whether it's like, you know, when I, when I used to work out like twice a day, mm-hmm. I, I that the reason I worked out twice a day is because I was like okay well I'm not working out enough or I'm not burning yeah. enough calories so it does I do I do get that part of it well and again I don't and it's perceived as it's like why is that a problem like if I if I yeah. think about 17 things at once like why I don't consider that a problem I consider that one a gift yeah but the problem is is you don't have enough people that have a wheelhouse or the tools to show you how to how to actually put that forward yeah that that I think is the biggest yeah, thing. Yeah, stop seeing it as a negative and use it more in harmony with what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And focus the energy and yeah, yeah. different things. Because that's what I do. Like when I'm when I'm like creating, I like creating a lot of different things. I like making music. I love doing video okay. editing. I love web development. I, I I like doing a lot. And what happens is like okay, when I'm like clogging my brain mm-hmm. and I'm not feeling it, like the creative side dips out when I'm editing. Yeah, I'll go make music for a little bit, and I just kind of level everything out, you know. Yeah, and just take everything in moderation. And it, it balanced me out a lot more, but there's still a lot of times that, like you said, I get that nervous, that well, nervousness. And to add to all those things that you did and back to something you asked me earlier, mm-hmm. once, I mean, with all, then all those practices, unified theory, mm-hmm. you know, and the unified theory, I want to make this very clear. doesn't have to be something that, you know, is tangible or even necessary that you can describe. It may be yeah. an affinity towards a certain feeling, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. you just described five or four vastly different things that you cycle through in a single creative session. Yeah. You know, so I, I think search the, the search for a unified theory doesn't has, have to necessarily be something you can fully describe, mm-hmm. I think is very important to yeah. know. Yeah, and, sure. and that's Chuck, that's something that Chuck recently just started doing because okay. because I noticed that, uh, uh, I mean, we've always done this thing where we're like, we'll get bored with photography mm-hmm. or we'll get bored with video. So we swap back and forth uh, and then do graphic design. And then he just recently started picking up like web web uh, okay. website building and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, I just And like I, I walk into his room at like two in the morning and he's right there like clicking through all the menus and everything. And I'm like, yeah. bro, well, like how many things do you have to add to your list of things that you do? And then he like, because everything he does, he does really well. Uh, which is kind of scary. It's kind of scary. <laughs> I, well, I'd say like half, half. Like they're not terrible. You know what I mean? But yeah. they're not. See, and, and that's amazing. another thing that he has going on is, and I know he does this jokingly, but like he, 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 he has the, he puts up this front that he's not very good at things. Okay. When in pers- in retrospective, people always compliment everything that he does. So like, I, how do you feel about that being something that that people have where it's like they they don't have that much of a self esteem to back up their own ego. I think it's kind of the way you more back it up. I think certain people back it up more in a reserved way. Mm-hmm. I mean, certain people have an affinity more towards it just as like a respect culture. They don't want to talk about anything. They don't want to talk about their work. They don't want to have to explain any of that shit. They just like, here it is, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and other people, I think, it, uh, you know, just talk about it more as maybe a ritual of reinforcement, yeah. you know, and just how they are as a person. I don't yeah. see either one um, right or wrong. Uh and in the end, I would hope there would be some merriment between because I've seen individuals extreme on both ends. Mm-hmm. So as long as I mean, there's a difference between, I think, being reserved and there being an absence of mm-hmm. yeah, esteem yeah, definitely. or confidence. Yeah. Um, and once again, I think something that I do not appreciate about the current era is the is all the, the be humble, stay humble, because there's no element of risk taking. Yeah. Exactly. Like if you say you're going to do something, if you tell me, you know, in three months, I'm going to run a mile and a half in this time, right? As opposed to in three months, you know, I'm going to time myself for a mile and a half and the best I can do is the best I can do. I'm sorry. I think that latter method is horseshit. Like mm-hmm. I think the first method, I think think to be able to put yourself out there and really hold yourself accountable I, that is what it's about yep and i think that the humble thing is completely misunderstood and misconstrued yeah, yeah. i think it, saturated for sure like people just use it in the wrong terminology i think yeah. and they use it the wrong ways damn like, you kendrick lamar yeah what i use it is more of the fact that i know there's no such thing as perfection everything mm. has flaws mm. till the day okay. you die yeah there's it's infinite mm-hmm. just like life so how i see it is like oh i can do better I tried my hardest and mm-hmm. I did like I didn't half ass it like I tried my hardest but I know for sure I see so many things that I need to fix and I need to correct myself for the next time and I do and it progresses me you know yeah. super fast because I'm not being cocky but I'm also not being too humble where I'm like damn all my shit sucks 
Like yeah. there's a little bit of confidence behind yeah. it. You know what I mean? Cause I yeah. know I'm not terrible. I know yeah, I'm yeah. not like some people <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Do, do you ever feel that like people perceiving your work as one thing or the other kind of like influence you to not, not be like as arrogant about your work? Like, do, do like, you for, like for example, like let's say you just made something like a dope design do you feel like you'd rather not even talk about the design to other people because then they'll be like, oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you? How, you could have, we could have made it better this way. And then at the end of the day, everybody's opinions comes comes back yeah. comes back into it. I guess that's the one thing too is like, um, it's it's hard to explain because like if I'm working for a client, I can't really say anything because it's it's their thing. But yeah. if I'm doing something that makes me feel happy, mm-hmm. like of course, like I, I can give two shits with somebody. Like when I DJ, that's like one of the biggest things. Like I don't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. what you think about the music i'm playing because yeah. i'm literally playing for myself yeah if you don't like it you can walk out like but that's the only thing i'm really like I, i'll never be like what is it well i can't even say that because i have been but influenced to play mm-hmm. the good music or dancier music or mm-hmm. whatever to go you with the say. trend yeah i'm like no i like most of the time i'm like yo i'm gonna play what i want to hear today mm-hmm. you might not like it but well yeah and i think there's a certain level of being unapologetic for sure that you have to be yeah but back to something we talked about earlier that's what i mean when it paired to be sensitivity within creativity is mm-hmm. there needs to be a certain level of unapologetic you know no fucks given in terms of whatever you're doing yeah for sure but you know if you're trying to re- if if the goal is is that you're trying especially trying to reach a greater and greater audience there has to be a level of sensitivity mm-hmm. you know especially because we've reached a level that hate is seen as a le- as something as like an affectation mm-hmm it has disabled people from progressing even further because when people criticize their work, what happens they is... They crumble. <laughs> they crumble or they're just like, ah, oh, whatever, man, he's a hater or whatever it may yeah. be. You know, where there, there's certain definitely a certain value and certain merit uh, to being able to constantly expand your audience for sure. Oh, no, for sure. Yeah. And there's, that's hate, there's hate and there's constructive criticism mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't get that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Wait, so, so then let me ask you, there's yeah. a, one of the last questions I have on here. Yeah. Do you think that how you view yourself has an impact on how far you go and how much you achieve in life? For sure, 100%. I think, uh, I think there has to be a certain perspective of almost like from first person, but I guess if, if you would say like from third person, I, I get asked a lot actually if I get nervous before I teach and I, I tell, I, I don't at all. Did you, know? you ever? That, that, that's, I, a, that's one of those things because yeah. even though I feel like I can teach you personally something, uh-huh. I feel like me getting in front of a class and ha- having that authority over people of like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I am going to be, this, I'm going to be somebody that you learn from play, messes with me, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I, I did at a certain point. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Okay. Uh, I wasn't completely disabled. I don't think anyone is, is completely, I've yeah. never met anyone who's completely disabled from it. Um, but once again, viewing yourself from the outside in. So I look at it like this. I go to this classroom that I've never been to before. You know, the students are awaiting, th- this is the narrative I tell myself. The students are awaiting me, you mm-hmm. know. They're awaiting for great things to happen and for this class to happen in which I know I can deliver. And so when I see it kind of like that, almost like from the student's perspective, that there's all this anxiety and me coming to teach and what am I going to bring to teach because no one ever really knows what I'm yeah, going to bring to teach unless sure. you've yeah. had a class before. Um, when I see it from that lens, from the outside in, every time, I mean. It's much more calm. Like I even say mantras to myself of like, I can't be stopped when I'm doing my warm ups. Like, so, like just constantly programming myself that yeah. it doesn't matter who the audience is. And I'm always very mindful of the audience. And this goes back to the be humble thing. Yep. Like when I taught um, the group of uh, people who were 60 and up, you know, that was a big learning experience for me. I had never worked with anyone in that capacity, you know, working with, you know, teenage girls and teenage guys who are 15, 16, 17 in their prime, it's much different. It's like complete opposite end. Mm-hmm. But still there was that same level of kind of outside in, they're here for a certain reason. All I have to do is show up and deliver. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, to add, I think that's the biggest thing. I think that's something people lack is there's always this first person narrative. I, I think if people embraced more from like the outside in and they saw that third person narrative, it would vastly change whatever whatever you approached. Yeah, I never even thought of it like that. But it's kind of like I'm the, the mentality of like they're more afraid of you than you are of them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. You know what I mean? I've never heard of that, but that's yeah. funny. So I hate like bugs. <laughs> that's how I feel with bugs. With bugs? Yeah, they're like. It's more afraid of you than I'm like, nah, I fucking, I'm fucking scared right now. Bro, that's one thing you've never gotten over, huh? It's like no, bugs. Like I can't, bro. Yeah. Really? Like, bro, when like, 
there's like big cockroaches like there was one in my room and it was huge bro i was like yeah i can't be around here <laughs> i had to walk out because I, I don't know it, it scares the fuck out of me like i'll never I, and i don't want to hurt them like i don't want to hurt them but i'm like i don't know how to capture you either but okay like reptiles are you scared of too or is it just no, bugs it's just bugs like i, can, I think it's the sliminess of them. i can hold snakes i can hold snails i can hold like all that like that doesn't scare yeah. me but a tarantula will fucking like scare the shit out of me or a cockroach or big ass cricket. Yeah. Do I you, don't know. Do you, do you have any fears, Ryan? It being October. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, spooky. Well, first thing I'll talk about the bugs real fast and then I'll, yes, yeah, I will. Help me, help me out. Um, no, I grew up in a household where my father was, I mean, extreme in terms of all the animals he brought in and the bugs. So I don't know that it just became a certain point for me. Cause I was always in a similar boat. I would wake up with, anacondas underneath me Ooh. i mean i would be cooking there'd be a lizard on the floor yeah he used to kill black widows with his bare hands yeah see that's I mean, the thing i can't i'm I mean, like whoa crazy stuff i don't know and just and for me i just got to a point i'm like well if he can do it like i'm like i can you know kind of deal um i think the thing for and i don't know how you feel about this but i think there's a certain unknown like if you if you approach something and you don't know how it moves or how it truly interacts yeah, i think that's what scares you're me. like that's you, you don't know how to approach yeah, it like, almost like a, a snake in my mind, I kind of know like it. Worst case scenario, yeah, yeah. I know how to grab it, yeah, you yeah. know, but it's like, I don't know. Insects just scare the, because f- I think it's their reaction times too, like how fast they move sometimes. Yeah. And I hate that because I'm not, I get scared easily. You yeah. know what I mean? It, it's trippy how, how fast they do move. Cause it like, is. You know, uh. It, in terminologies of a human based yeah. the matter have you, have you ever seen movies where like you see like this big old giant and it's going very slow like do you think that's how they view us do you think they're like not we're moving? really fast I don't, yeah no because i know how to like kill flies with my bare hands i think it's just how they perceive it really yeah, yeah. for sure yeah, yeah yeah um what's the trick to it because i've always tried to catch those buggers and catch them or never do kill, it. kill them we'll catch them and kill you could do the, i guess like one in the same yeah he um, walks around with the dart just go <laughs> just spits a little it. salt yeah <laughs> for the flies you have to uh trap them in a vortex of air oh explain so you it's so if i funnel if a fly's here yeah and i funnel the air here as it comes up how do you funnel that air you just well from i, I shouldn't say funnel i should say pressure the air mm-hmm. so as i push it in on both sides the fly then because the fly senses the pressure right so the pressure so it has to go up exactly so especially can... if i cut my hands like this <sighs> i go here come up and like a triangle yeah do do you think that's why fly swatters work so well? Because of the the air that I wouldn't imagine. That's I, think, how they work I don't though. think fly swatters work that great. You know I what's mean, crazy? Yeah. I I finally learned how to do it. You go behind them. You go if you go behind a fly. Uh, yeah, they have eyes all over, but they're still to a certain point. But they're so small. Spot. How do you know when you're behind it? Huh? How do you, you know can, when you're you behind the fly? You can see where the eyes are. No. Yeah. I don't. And that, yeah. But I know we don't you, have much you, flies around here. You don't do like it's not a bad problem to have. <laughs> what is it? You don't do like a quick one. Yeah. You don't get right near and do it. You that's do another it from thing. High up, yeah. And then you come down. Ah. Like that. That's how I get them all the time with the fly swatter. It's interesting too. I can't think. I don't know if you guys can have any animals in the animal kingdom because there's a fundamental asymmetry between the front of your body and that right. I mean, yeah. The front of your body being so well equipped for everything in the back, like you have no clue what's going yeah. on. Yeah. You know, and it seems to be a prevalent theme throughout the entire animal kingdom that I can't think of any animals that are equipped to defend themselves equally from back or front. Um, I'm pretty sure there's 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 some animals who have not eyes but sensors. Uh huh. Um, I can't think of which ones. Right? Animals or insects. Animals. 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 Mm. It sounds more like an insect kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I think an insect <laughs> Not an or animal. a fish I mean, probably. Like a mammal animals. or something. No. I would definitely think something in the sea for yeah. sure. But yeah. that's yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, being buoyant in the water. Yeah, you can't even um, get them. You would yeah. think that's like a really good feature to have, huh? Like if people, like if, Eyes if, on if, the there, back of your head. if there is such a thing as evolution, why haven't we gotten to it yet? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> well, in combat, that's the thing that's always sought after is taking the back in any way. Yeah. So that's why I mention it because it is something that's such a big theme in martial arts and combat like is to get around to the backside. That's, so yeah. yep. so tell me about your experience in, in martial arts like how 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 did you get uh just that background did you start in high school and what type of martial arts yeah like what you know okay so, so many so the the biggest focus of martial arts was internal martial arts so everyone knows what tai chi is yeah yep. so there's a brother and sister art called xing yishuan and bagua shuan whoa um those i'd say are two big focuses there's something called chang sin um that is actually developed by a guy in the states in the 80s uh chang sin is very principle based um wing chun kung fu i took i Wait, could wing chun uh-huh that's, uh, that's the one that uh it man it man it man it man that's what you pronounce it uh uh-huh. uh-huh. yeah because i did kempo karate and oh, okay. i became a black belt yeah, oh so brilliant. i was like 
I did that for a while. Kind of forgot it all. Okay. But it, it definitely taught me a lot. You yeah, know yeah, I mean? for sure. Absolutely. And I think it's a great process. I think it's a very, um, I don't know, there's, there's just something very engaging about it. You know, whether it be the conquering of self or the conquering of the opponents mm-hmm. or both thereof, I think there's it's just very engaging. Um, but the, yeah, those were I'd say were the primary disciplines. My mom taught me the chancla. <laughs> the flying just took out the chancla. Yeah. Bam! Right across the I haven't learned the art of the chancla yet. Man, there's an art to it. I've man. heard there is. You have to of... think about buoyancy in the air. And, you know, when you, you know air resistance, kind of like how you fly a paper airplane. Okay, you know what I mean. Fair enough. There's an art to it, and it's the... probably the same lineage of people that developed the fly swatter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, it all came back full circle. Man. <laughs> so <laughs> Wait, so 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 you, so you dance as well, right? You don't just do mar- you didn't just do martial arts and I dance for sure. I uh, I performed at a few gigs, which I'm not a fan of performing um what what would you have against performing i don't it, it's just not the, it's just not the thrill i seek do, do you think you it's, too, it's helping too, people as well or is there's a certain challenging you know, though to helping people like if i tell you that i'm gonna get you to this point that means i have to be good at that point with my eyes closed doing it backwards mm-hmm. that's what i like about it mm. you know because i truly every time have to be the best in the room yeah you know, so and you, I'm so like, you have that competitive nature for sure. And like nine times out of 10, I'm the best in the room, but I, a lot of, but the, I, I, and I'm very honest too. If there's someone who's better, I just, you know, grab a notepad and pick, I'm one of those people who ask you 5,000 questions. Yeah. If there's a skill you have. Um, but yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. a good wisdom to have. How long did you do uh wing Chun for? Sorry. Wait, how do you say it? Wing a year out of school in town. Actually, it's off a of DI in Arville. Oh, I don't okay. know if they're still there. It was years I ago. I didn't know they, they, they taught that here. That's yeah, interesting. the dude um, that taught it, he was taught by someone. I think it was one. It was basically secondhand down from Itman. It was Itman and him. Really? Yeah. So it was Itman, him, and then my teacher. Yeah. Damn, that's crazy. Um, Dang. So yeah, I mean, and it was a you know um, very enlightening school. Uh, they go over some very interesting principles that are very specific to Wing Chun. Yeah, and in, I, and in certain MMA fighters, I, I notice when I see them. Yeah. Uh, which is cool to see um but yeah uh so wing chun aikido um yeah and internal martial arts i would say is where my biggest focus was mm-hmm. um there's a certain softness that in, that's involved in those martial arts that i became obsessed with yeah mm-hmm. definitely because how, how do you feel about not to cut you off but yeah. like how, how do you feel about because i know wing chun was more of like a thing that was used for uh like I don't know if it was self defense or like kind of like the for you to use it not to use it against somebody in a competitive nature how do you feel I about that? I think that's most martial arts. Really? Yeah. I thought karate was so you could kick somebody's butt. Well, there are certain, certain ones that are more, <laughs> I guess. Uh, <laughs> there are certain ones I think that are more offensive and defensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, point blank, I think that it's necessary for them to be in the cage or on an MMA platform in order to test their value and mm-hmm. th- their contributions. Sure. I mean, at the end, there are certain things that were maybe not meant to be as combative, I guess, if you will, yeah. but to, to, to test all their, their ideas, you know, BJJ is the quintessential of being defensive, mm-hmm. oh, you know, for sure. so, I mean, the position is from your back. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it is very necessary for sure. Um, sometimes the antics I don't en- enjoy as much, but certain antics I also do enjoy very yeah, much. Same here. What do you mean by antics? I think the way certain people carry themselves or go about, um, just as a competitor or a champion mindset, yeah. I think the fight this weekend was a prime example. Um, I didn't even watch it, man. What? So what you guys, happened? Because I know, I think I saw some some clips where it looked like a like a WWC. Well, I mean, no, that was the end. I, yeah, I heard yeah. the fight was kind of. The fight was exactly the fight was. Because eh. it was one sided. Oh really? Totally. Yeah. Well, it was just. Well, the whole thing is, is I don't know how much you guys. Know. I'm a huge for follower, every, so for you're everybody. In for, uh, for everybody who's listening to this, by the way, we're talking about the fight between was it Khabib and, alert. and Connor UFC and, 229. Yeah. There we go. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Proceed. Alert. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, you're fine. Um. So yeah, I don't know how much you guys know about Connor and Khabib. Yeah. Um. So Connor specializes a lot more in stand up. Mm-hmm. Um. Khabib has more of. It's very grappling based, but it's it's. And not even grappling based like you would see in a guy like Yul Romero. I don't know if you guys know who Yul Romero is. He's an MMA middleweight. Mm. Um, but it's it's this constant pressure. It's this constant exhausting, like, he's just wearing on you. Mm. Like, he doesn't even, a lot of the matches, he doesn't tap people out. I'll put, in, put it to you this way. He has the record for most takedowns in a match. Okay. But the match went all, all it was three rounds for that match. So it shows you he's going to take you tw- down 21 times. 
you'll get up 22 times. But to be taken down 21 times is exhausting. The dude's just done. Yeah. I mean, that's why he never loses a round. So they fought. um, First round was pretty much a dud. Uh, Second round, there was a little more action. Third round, it was, I think it was finished in third or fourth. That bottom line, it was finished. Connor lost. Uh, due to a neck crank, I don't know if you guys know what a neck crank is. Yeah, um, I saw the position he had him in. It's like a guillotine, yeah. but over, but it was like over the your chin. chin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is, is that more? Is that like pressure towards you, uh, your head, or your neck, or how does that work? It's more, I guess you could say. Uh, like, what, what what is the reason behind that being the move that finished him off? I don't because a lot. Well, certain people can't get under the chin, right? You can't mm-hmm. get yeah. under the chin because to finish someone. So there's neck. there's methods where people come over the chin and they push their elbow in the back. It's so painful. Ooh. And so it's a constant pressure like this. Yeah. People's jaws break because of it. Jeez. Um. And so Connor tapped, et cetera, et cetera. Afterwards, uh, Connor's jujitsu coach, I guess, was talking shit. And then Khabib jumped the cage. Yep. He jumped the cage and to attack Dylan Dennis, which to me, honestly, don't care. Like, Connors jumped the cage to attack Jose Aldo. Like, I yeah. think, like, they did it. That was fine. The problem was, is when Khabib did that, three of Khabib's corner men jumped the cage yeah. and jumped Connor. Mm. That, I think, was where things became a little dicey. Yeah. Because now you have people who, you know, now aren't becomes fighting. a street fight. Like, it's, Yeah. Yeah, three against one. So I mean, for Khabib, it's it's all fair. I mean, Connor's tons of people have done the same sh- have done the same yeah. stuff for sure. Yeah. Um, do Do you think they're gonna revoke his uh, belt? No, I do. Well, no. I don't think so. I think they'll. Um, I think they'll give him. The word is that they'll give him a six month suspension and fine him a quarter of a mil. Seems fair. Yeah. Damn, I think it's it's really good leverage for everything, and I hope they fight again. I don't know. I I see things like that sometimes, man, and I uh-huh. think like this is all a show. shock value. Like it, it's 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 one of those things that like they do like it's planned out to get people to talk about the sport so it can go kind of viral. How do you feel about that? I don't think it's as planned out as as people think it is. You don't I think, think so? No, I th- I think certain people. I mean, I I think uh, I think in that light, I think a lot of people show very odd sides of their character. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen anything. I've seen some stuff where I think I'm like, okay, like it's not even like the person. But the way it all happened, it seemed it seemed fairly, you know. Uh, like in my he mind, had hate. He was. Oh, th- and there was for sure hate for sure. Yeah. Um, well, didn't the whole fight happen because of what McGregor did to that bus yeah, or something to the like bus, that? Yeah. Well, the fight originally happened because Khabib slapped Connor's teammate, and that's why Connor uh, came at him with the bus. Oh, I didn't even know that. Backstory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. so uh, so yeah, that had happened, and then the bus, the Dolly incident happened, which because the people can compare like the Dolly incident, the Khabib incident. There, I mean, there's two very different factors as I see it. Uh-huh. I mean, the Dolly incident, you know, it's in you know under underground under a stadium at Barclays, dealing only with fighters, not at a sanctioned event. Mm-hmm. Khabib jumps the cage, starts a riot at an event that you know is nearly is the largest UFC event ever. That's mm-hmm. that's in co association with the Nevada State Athletic Commission. So there's just a lot more on the line too. He just did it. At, he honestly just did it at a bad time. Yeah, like it was just poor timing. It, it was really bad timing because like, really wasn't the uh, the governor or something there? The governor the, was there. Governor was governor there, and was he ended up being escorted out. <laughs> governor because of was it, there, and it just made UFC look really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Metro did a good job though. I mean, because I don't know if you guys remember like the Lennox Lewis and Tyson fight when there was that riot afterwards. I think mm. it was it Lewis and Tyson or Lewis and Holyfield. Before my time. I don't know which one it was. But whichever one it was, I mean, there were riots all through the casino, still out on the streets. I mean, the cool thing was is security and Metro did a really good job of just keeping it in the arena and quarantining it and cutting it off there. Yeah. yeah. So it didn't actually affect, because it would have been, I think it would have been a much different story if it wound up affecting uh, yeah. people who paid to come see the show. For, yeah, sure. for sure. I think we'd be hearing a much different narrative. Um, the UFC never really seemed involved or interested in suspending him either. Um mm-hmm. The only way they were going to suspend him is if his visa would have gotten revoked or, or suspended. Yeah, somebody says. Yeah, because at that, that point, if your visa gets revoked, it's like you're fucked, dog. Like you literally can't even be. Well, exactly, because in the UFC, but okay, you can't defend the title. Goodbye. Like and they that, make the UFC look good too. Like oh, and the UFC doesn't have to get their hands dirty. It's yep. a very good move on the UFC's part. Yeah. yeah. Um. Have you have you ever done any kind of like fights in MMA? Like no, no. I think. I think in retrospect, I probably would have, um, just because I enjoy that process very much. But no, Mm-mm. Bellator. <laughs> Bellator's up and coming. Yeah. Bellator, it's What's what Bellator? the sport needs. Uh, it's like the up and coming people. Like, uh, oh, okay, that's the best way I can explain yeah. it. You know, okay. my homie, like he won a few, and I was like, good shit, dog. 
Yeah. Like that should surprise me because he's this little skinny Asian guy. You know what I mean? I was wondering yeah, how people end it. up getting into that that sport of like yeah. how do you how do you make it to those big UFC fights? Yeah, that that's is that is that essentially where you start? You get your 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 start for sure. Like you yeah. know, like the tough enough comes out here. The tough enough fights. Who I, I want to see those in person. Yeah, those um, would be tight too. I mean, people start at like local venues like that for sure, and then mm. just kind of build their way up. Okay. A um, little bit easier seems- in the MMA realm compared to boxing for sure the yeah. boxing realm is a lot more saturated it's a lot more nepotistic it's a lot more political it's political for sure. as fuck yeah dang well yeah. this conversation really got ahead of me man <laughs> it really got out of yeah. my hands here <laughs> we started talking about the eczema project <laughs> moved on to hey, uh, mcgregor it's and all Khabib, unified man. but yeah it's very good, very good. It's all unified. Did, did you have any more that. questions for ryan no that was that was basically was there anything else that you wanted to talk about personally I guess I want to hear how you guys got started with this this whole show. I was very interested. On the way over, I was like, I wonder how they got started with this whole game. Mm, it's a pretty interesting story. I mean, we've always we've always wanted to start a podcast. It's not okay. that interesting, but yeah, go ahead. Well, no, Sorry. it's just a long <laughs> no, story. Just, just a long <laughs> I mean, you can give me the abridged version <laughs> if you don't want to give me the long version. Okay, so Chuck and I met a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, we, uh, we, we've been friends since like 2000, what, 2010? Some shit. Like yeah, that. Two, okay. like, 2009, 2010. Okay, it's, it's been a while. Um, but we've we've always done creative things together as far as shooting videos, doing photo shoots, things like that. We've always just been friends. Um, and then we actually rented a studio downtown where we would do all of our shoots out of. Um, and when we had the space, we would spend a lot of time together because we were always in that 1,200 square foot uh, room. Okay. Um, and then one day, uh, I'm like, I'm I like to listen to a lot of Joe Rogan podcasts, a lot of different yeah. different podcasts. Yeah. Uh. Theo Vaughn's one of one, uh, H3H3, like a bunch of podcasts. And I've always t- t- told Chuck, like, we should do a podcast with the two of us because I feel like that's not something that's really done a lot. It's okay. always like one person. Um, so, and we also enjoy talking to a lot of creative people. However, the thing was when we had our studio, it was just audio only. We didn't have an idea of how to do what we're doing now as far as live streaming the event yeah. and then live streaming it through multiple cameras. So when we, we got a house together, um, we again spend a lot of time together and then there are some times when we have free time and one thing that kind of gets to us both is when we have too much free time there's not enough to do you know we're like let's just do a podcast yeah let's I'm start it. it so we, back in july we just literally no it was like the end of june we started testing it out just the cameras and seeing what the technicals were yeah. and i think we did like two or three episodes by ourselves just the two of us with that blue background okay. uh, that we were live streaming to facebook and then we had an idea of like okay well what, what if we actually use our environment of where we live in Las Vegas and bring creatives, entrepreneurs, and people who are just on a grind and hustle Fresh. Uh, and bring them in and just yep. get to know them huh. a little bit because there's so many people out here in Las Vegas doing their thing. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, one of the things that, that kind of triggered me too was the fact that even though a lot, of, a lot of us may have similar backgrounds, our perspective is completely different. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, Tell our philosophies, yeah, yeah. how we think about things, how yep. we view the world. So it's always like, okay, so how can we also bring the community closer together out here in Vegas? Um, and when we start bringing people that people can say, oh, I know that guy, or I've heard of that guy, it kind of helps bring the community closer as yeah. far as like you you th- being knowledgeable about somebody else. Well, and I you found that there was like a, Shabrielle is how you pronounce her name? Oh, yeah. yeah, Shabrielle. Bomb music. I had never She's heard of dope. her. Yeah. I had no, I have listened to that song Flora more times than I can count. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's dope, dope, man. And she's Vegas based. You know? I mean, I super talented. It was crazy because like I, I had been following her music for a minute now, a year or two at least, um, and that was the first time on the podcast that I had met her. Okay. And just to kind of see her personality, like it made me even a bigger fan of her because I'm like, okay, now I can put like a personality to the music. Yeah. Uh, even though I'm a big fan of the music, when I get to know somebody personally, and see how they react to questions and they're just how they how they are it makes me a bigger a bigger fan of who they are yeah, yeah. so i mean 100%. i feel like you know as, as opposed to like you know and, the, and the, one of the things that i wanted this podcast to be based around was a, around conversation instead uh, of interview style, instead, instead of just you know? so, you know, so much interview 100%. Which, is, which is why i like going off off script off and, just talking yeah. Yeah. and just talking about your interests and things like that because i feel like if somebody really wanted to get to know you seeing your reactions and your answers to questions that more are not personal. traditional or more personal, mm-hmm. that's how they really get to know you. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, no, I, I think that's a great way to gauge people based, based on reaction. So reactions. I'm not sure how how much, um, how far this podcast will go as far as um, bringing just entrepreneurs, creatives, and things like that on here. Uh-huh. Um, because, I mean, we're, 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 we only pe- uh, interview people here in Vegas because that's who we have access to. Since we just started this, we don't necessarily have like money to say, oh, I want to bring in the celebrity Joe and Rogan. have him Joe, yeah we don't want <laughs> exactly like we don't shit. we don't have Joe Rogan money yeah. to where we can have somebody fly in from New York and do the podcast you know uh so but the thing was is uh 
what I was saying is like we don't necessarily know how far as far as interviewing people out here because you only have a finite resource of people to interview out here in Vegas. Uh-huh. Um, so one day, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we may uh, actually be able to work our way there to where we can have other people outside of Las Vegas come through. Okay. So, I mean, our, our only thing is 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 not just Las Vegas creative people or entrepreneurs, but all over the world. You know, mm. like we want to bring people in from yeah. all over the world because conversation is how you get to know somebody. Yeah. For and sure. I, I'll say the biggest thing with this too is we just have fun doing it. It's like, yeah. it's not a job to us. It's not anything hard. It's pure passion. So yeah. As a matter beautiful. of fact, let's speak a little bit about that because we actually made this podcast as easy as possible. Yeah. Because w- w- one of the things, and I don't know how, if you can relate, but like when there's roadblocks in your way, you tend to, it, it tends to be less easy for you to do and you find more excuses to not do them. Okay. So well, the what we have going on right now, we have it set up to a way to where it's as easy as possible for us for us to do. So the camera, oh, the camera angles, the picture profiles, everything's already set. Uh, if we wanted to do a podcast, it wouldn't take us more than five six minutes to start it all together. Yeah. Um, and then we already know how we're gonna how we're gonna shoot the episodes. How we're gonna like even when it when it comes to editing the videos, because people always say you do so many episodes. Like, how do you have time to sit through an hour or two hours of video every week to sure. you know for multiple episodes yeah, and, yeah. and cut them up? Well, the thing is, we, like we were so lazy. That we actually, the reason we live stream it is so that we can switch multiple camera angles with the remote. Um, so we have all the cameras HDMI'd into a switcher. Uh, okay. And that's just basically so that YouTube, so whenever, so if you, somebody watching our video right now on YouTube, the camera's on me. If you start talking, Chuck switches the camera to you. Now those edits are recorded live. And then, oh, how interesting. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. then that so way, we don't have to do that. We have external. to do, we how don't do smart. any editing. Yeah. I have much respect. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like a work, work smarter, not harder kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's the difference between, you know, work smarter, not harder. Um, you know, the difference between like wanting to take on a challenge and something just being a pain in the ass. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, because then you start getting, you start getting, it starts becoming a job. But For when sure. you find out this way, yeah, yeah. I think it's just cool too, because I like those challenges. Yeah. I like figuring out things like, how do, how can I make this easier? There yeah, has yeah. to be a way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and so, and especially when you're going to go after and achieve certain things, because you have to account for the days that like, you're going to get up and you're like, dude, I don't want to, yeah. you know, exactly. sometimes. So to make it as easy as simple, I totally get that. I totally understand. That makes a lot of sense. Plus, plus we always, we've always had conversations with people out here in Las Vegas and uh, it's always a unique experience, man. We're like just talking to people. It's a, it's a good thing. Like we, we've had conversations where it's like two, three hours long and it's yeah. just, we're just talking outside or something. Mm-hmm. And then we think, man, this would have been a great podcast episode because <laughs> the thing is, like, you get to know somebody's creativity, but then you, they go off tangent, go into conspiracy theories and talk to, <laughs> talk to you about this. Yeah. And, and next thing you know, you're like best friends because you've, you've already explored so many different topics, you mm-hmm. know? So, yeah, I mean, I, I have really high hopes for this podcast. I, 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 like I said, it's, we said it's not a job to us. It's fun. And that's yeah. why we like doing it. Yeah. Well, so. I mean, I think and there's that saying a person. um, who's having fun is, is a dangerous person to have around. I mean, cause that's how things really get done. Yeah. Yep. I mean, when someone's really interested in that process and yeah. if there's just nothing to lose and nothing that every time you can put all your chips on the table. Yeah, cause what are you yeah. going to lose? Exactly. That's that whole thing. So, I mean, even from our first episode, it's evolved so much from not even just shooting it, but the way we format yeah, it so much. and then to the way we present it online in social media, yeah. it's all kind of like a game to us, you know, yeah. like, like how much can we do? How, how much, further can we push it yeah you know what i mean so well, i'm all about that i think yeah. that's i think that's where it's at i mean it has to and you have to be in something that constantly you know you can constantly push that limit and push that limit mm-hmm. and back to what we were talking earlier i think the difference is is some people will co- seek to push a limit past a certain point but who knows i mean maybe there will come a, a point in time when you guys will outgrow this and you're like okay i want to adventure into this now yep mm-hmm. and the difference is is the people who will still stay in it because that's where they started Mm-hmm. Versus the people who will move on to something because they're like, okay, I've evolved into this now. Yeah. Because when people move from one area to the other, one discipline to the other, one field to the other, there's a certain abandonment I've noticed that people have in the field prior. Like if they leave it, like they can't leave it because it's their baby. Mm-hmm. You know, but ultimately it hinders the user. It yeah. really does. Yeah. And that's back to what we were talking about defending your dogma because the people get to a certain point and they look back and like, oh, I, I can't, I can't give it up. Yeah. Um, but it does, it caps you if you don't. So it's no, yeah, I mean, uh, we always say like, if this, yeah. if this ever got boring or not interesting to us, we're, yeah, we would move on to the next thing move or, on or, or find figure, a way, yeah, figure or figure out a way to it keep more. it more interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean, so it's, I mean, I think that it's that battle that yeah. helps you keep going to the next level. For sure. Um, mm-hmm. And one thing too, like we, we, uh, it, this podcast is a good way for us to kind of like learn about people and like learn how to speak 
learn how to talk. Okay. You know, kind of like I'm learning it, as it, we it, go, so I'm in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it gives us. I feel like it gives us as as creatives. Creatives are very introverted sometimes. Um. So. I mean, even with some of the guests, which is why we've had like kind of like an outline of conversation for us. Uh-huh. We never know if someone's going to be introverted or actu- yeah. extroverted, because um, sometimes we get somebody like you who can just talk and talk, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and it comes naturally to them. You know what I mean? But then some people will give you like a yes or no question, okay. and, and I feel like it's us kind of up to us sometimes to kind of get, break the get ice that, too. yeah, break the ice Make and them keep feel that comfortable. Okay, yeah, exactly. Make them feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, a lot a of people way. I know, like they they come in, they're like, "Yo, I was super nervous," but then they kind of like. Talk to us for a little bit, and they're like, "Oh, these fools are literally chill. Yeah. No intimidation, no nothing." So yeah, yeah. Like, Plus, a lot of the gigs that we do, like sometimes it can be kind of corporatey, and you have to act and behave a certain way. Mm-hmm. And this way, it's kind of like it's, yeah. we're just we're just two homies. Like, can't say you know, no problem. Exactly. Have to say my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, it's fun. Plus, it teaches us how to how to open up conversation and talk to people. And it, it's kind of like a selfish thing too, because I think it has to be. It, it's a selfish thing yeah. for us because we get to learn so much about other th- other people and other things. Like the like Zemo project, yeah, would have almost never have known about that had we not gotten in contact. Mm, you know. Yeah. So like that's something that and other people as well. Uh, one of the other reasons is because once we do this podcast, we have the audio and video up online forever. Like it's it's up there. You know, like if anybody ever wanted to learn about the Eximo project, learn about me, learn about Chuck, yep. it's up there. There there's a reference. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Till the important. internet disappears. Yeah. Until we go uh, decentralize yeah. the internet with Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to bring it in. Are you in a Bitcoin? I'm not. No, okay. I. Uh... I'm not more of a on, on the real estate end. I think I, I, more physical assets I enjoy more than yeah. Um, I guess you could say financial instruments. I wouldn't consider Bitcoin a financial instrument. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I guess you could call it that. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, I guess you could call it that. I mean, I'm. Uh, but no, it, it, it's, it's very. Uh, how do you say? What's the word? Volatile. Volatile. Yeah. I've heard it's, it's extremely very, volatile. I've heard it's very volatile. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it can go. I mean, it's gone. Like, but if you look at the trend. In the long term, it Always only up. goes up. It yeah. only goes up. Yeah. Yes, it has these spikes of dropping 90%. Yeah going up 20,000 percent but it's like you know it's always yeah. that if you think long term as you should any investment it only goes up yeah uh, mm-hmm. but yeah man we we, we got to have you back on here as a real estate agent i feel because yeah. we we wanted to have a real estate agent on here to <laughs> yeah. answer some questions man yeah, yeah we want like cpas we want bookers we want oh, people yeah. oh i think yeah. i saw that on your instagram yeah. story that yeah. you were looking for uh for like a cpa or financial planner yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we might have one on this friday depending okay i have to email if you guys back. are still looking i have a i mean a slew of people in my building I okay mean, yeah yeah, yeah if me, they're comfortable with talking about it and they want to talk about it if like you're still definitely. looking yeah okay let yeah. me know for perfect. sure okay perfect well ryan we appreciate you yeah, having on the podcast. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm happy to be here, yeah. man. This is awesome. We're going to go ahead and put all your information down in the description down below. Brilliant. iTunes, Spotify, everything. Uh, but just real quick, do you want to just let people know where they can find you and find out more information about you? Uh, Instagram is the.eximo, E-X-I-M-O dot project. And then just my website's www.theeximoproject.com. There you go. You guys cool, heard cool. it here first. That's thank it. you guys for tuning in. We'll catch you guys on the next morning dinner. Later. Cool. Every time I come in the kitchen, you in the kitchen. In the goddamn refrigerator. I sure am hungry.